It was February 1973, and it was a cold, snowy night in Montreal. And my brother and I got separated from our parents in a large department store in the center of the city. This overzealous security guard at 9 o'clock decided to kick us out rather than help us find our parents. I remember, I remember that moment like it was yesterday, just being out on the street, terrified. I was a nine-year-old, and there I was. We hadn't even dressed for the cold. We'd come in by subway, and there I was, so nervous, and I just saw, I remember seeing the car lights, and I, the snow was coming down, and I didn't really know where home was as a nine-year-old. And then, and then my brother started to cry. I remember looking down at him, and he looked up at me, and he just said, Kev, I, I'm, I'm scared. I want mom. I, I want to go home. My brother was five. I remember taking his hand and said, being the big brother, don't worry, Mike, I'll take care of us. I'll get us home. And I started to walk. And I had no idea where I was going. And looking back on it now, I realized I walked south because I saw this building called the Chateau Champlain. And we as, a fa we as a family called it the cheese grater because there was these semicircular windows on it. And I remember seeing that building going, I know that building. I know that building's not the right way to home. So I turned around and I started to walk. And looking back on it now, I walked north. I wouldn't have recognized the street. There would have been St. Catherine Street. I wouldn't have recognized that. And De Maisonneuve Street. I wouldn't have recognized that. But then I saw, I saw Sherbrooke Street. And I recognized Sherbrooke Street. I remember going, I live near Sherbrooke Street. Maybe if I, maybe if I followed Sherbrooke Street, I'd get home. So I did. I started to walk, and as we did, it was freezing cold, and we'd, we'd slip into an apartment building, my brother and I, and we'd warm up, and then we'd come out again and keep walking. And after three hours, three hours of walking, I started to see familiar sights of my neighborhood. And there was a toboggan hill that we'd go on, and it was another hour before I got to my house. And I remember looking back on it as a nine-year-old boy, I remember seeing a, a police car in front of the house, and immediately going, there's a police car in front of my house. I wonder what's wrong. <laughs> and getting home, and I thought I had done something wrong. I remember getting home, and to very relieved parents and very relieved police officers, and I remember my, my mom saying to me how proud she was, how I'd, I'd taken care of myself and my brother. It was the scariest moment of my life, but really, it was the most empowering. After that, I had this crazy dream that I was going to ski to the South Pole. So I always look back on that point as that was the moment I began my adventuring career. Now, my architectural career, I can't point to a single moment like that, other than for all my life, I wanted to be an architect. It was, it was something I always wanted to do. How, I mean, think about it. You could dream something up, you could sketch it, you could build a model, and then people would build it? Like, how cool was that? I always wanted to do it. I did those self-assessments in school, and it always came up that, yeah, you should be an architect. And I'd always shrug my shoulders, yeah, I knew. I knew I wanted that. But interestingly, what I didn't understand, what I didn't understand was the culture of architecture. This culture of obsession, this culture of this manic workload, this culture of sacrificing everything at the altar of architecture. Now, I discovered that quickly, very quickly, when I went to McGill University School of Architecture. And a classmate of mine is here today, and she can remember this as well, was that on the second day, on the second day, I was given a project that there was no way I could complete. Our class, we stayed up all night, as we would, and at the next day, kind of stumbled in, realizing that, you know, there was no hope of finishing this, and they knew we couldn't finish it. They were setting a tone. They were saying, this is what it's going to be like for the next five years. This is what architecture is going to be like for the rest of your career. And so began the process. First year buried in architecture. I was doing well. I was enjoying what I was doing, but everything else fell apart. My social life ended. Lost my girlfriend, and I was into bike racing at the time. I quit that. I remember I was living on coffee and bagels and cream cheese. This was the life of the architect. By the end of first year, we lost a number of people in class, and, and second year again, 
equally hard, even harder still, and going through right towards, right towards Christmas exams, and then it all changed. Two weeks before Christmas, everything changed for me. You see, we were, we were, we were coming in towards our final crit, our final design crit, as we would, and in an architectural studio, for anyone who knows here, you're just working hard, and you're, you're in groups and teams, and I remember come Wednesday night for our Friday uh, our critique, we're working and staying up late, and I remember Dave and Julie near me, and they were a couple, they were sweethearts, and they were actually rallying themselves through this and helping us, frankly, as well as we went through our first night, all nighter, Wednesday, come Thursday, we're nowhere close to being done again, you're working, you're working, come Thursday night, you pull another all nighter. That's what you do in architecture, two all nighters in a row, shattered. Next morning, for anyone who's been to a critique in architecture, you post up your drawings, you spend all day trying to defend what your ideas were with peers, with classmates, with colleagues, as they tear it all apart. And then at the end of that day, exhausted, I remember Dave and Julie going, hey, we're going to, we're going to actually go dancing tonight. And I remember going, you guys are insane. Like, you can go all dancing you want. We have a freehand drawing class tomorrow morning from 9 to 12, our final class this year. And you go dancing, I'm going home to sleep. Next morning, coming onto campus, McGill campus, for anyone that knows it, this was December, it was cold, snowy. I remember coming through the doors of the uh, McDonald Harrington building, the architectural building, and right away, I knew something was wrong. It's weird how we know these things, right? I don't know why. And I remember going up the stairs, and then I thought I heard someone cry. It made no sense. Finally, I remember coming onto the upper floor where the studio was, and I just saw classmates, and this expression on their faces, I couldn't understand what was happening. I remember seeing Julie in a group, People were crying. I was like, where's Dave? And I remember looking at her. She turned and we, I, I, me and her eyes locked. And I'd never seen an expression like that before. This, this emptiness, this hollowness. Uh, and they were out dancing that night and Dave collapsed. He died in her arms. He was 19 years old. I remember in my pack, whatever. I just, I just stumbled out of the building. I just started to walk. And anyone who knows Montreal, right behind you is the mountain. And I remember just walking. It was the only therapeutic way I could deal with this. I just started to walk, and I walked. And I was just thinking, this makes no sense, you know? Like, I'm a young guy. This isn't supposed to happen. Why would... And you just... These things are running through your mind. Finally, I remember I got to a point. I just... In the snow, I just sat down, you know? I just sat, and I just bawled my eyes out. Just... And then... You know those moments in your life when you have that, when you put a stake in the ground, and from that moment on, everything is gonna be different? Well, that was that moment for me. You know, I, I couldn't go on like this. I wouldn't go on like this. And I, you know, I made a pact with myself right there. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna change the way I do things. I don't care. And from that point forward, I started to take, care better, take better care of myself. I started to actually, I started to uh, race again. I started to race at an elite level. I started to hang out with friends. I stopped just eating and drinking coffee and, and eating bagels and cream cheese and, and started to balance my life. And I let everything else just fall the way it would. And you know, and I anticipated at this point that my marks would drop, but they didn't. In fact, my marks started to improve. When I graduated, I graduated top of my class. I won the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, Canada Medal. And I won a Commonwealth Scholarship to Cambridge University. What I discovered, in fact, was that being obsessed with architecture and doing nothing but architecture didn't help my creativity. In fact, it hurt it. Balancing my life as an architect, in fact, was better for my creativity. And something else I did. Something else there, I dusted off an old dream. You see, I realized life is really short. And there's no better way to face that when you see a 19-year-old die, is that I had a dream to ski to the South Pole. I was going to go after that dream. I wasn't really sure how I was going to go after that dream, but I was going to go after it. And there began my, not symmetrical yet, but in tandem, my two careers moving forward as an architect, as an adventurer. Now, fast forward 10 years, interestingly, the first big milestone 
of my adventuring career would happen to coincide with the lowest point in my architectural career. At the time, I'd been laid off at my job, and I'd walked away from architecture, vowing never to return to it again. I worked for a practice in the city, a job I love with Dalalana Griffin Architects, they're called DGBK these days, and I love my job. And uh, they were a practice just hammered by the provincial freeze on a school budget. Everyone was laid off on the practice. And interestingly, in a twist of fate, the reason we were all laid off on that practice, because we did our job too well. You see, what happened was, we had designed this wonderful school for Glen Rosa, the Glen Rosa Junior Secondary, just on West Bank in Kelowna. And it was an awesome job for me. As a young architect, I worked directly with one of the partners. I remember him just sketching out the, the drawing for me and handing it over, and I just got lost in this thing, building a model, designing, and my ideas were accepted, they were embraced, hell, they were even built. It was this amazing moment for me as a young architect. Now, the, once the building was built, Students absolutely loved it. Teachers absolutely loved it. The community loved it, simply because it was working as a, as a community center in the evenings. It won the CEFPI award as top middle school in North America, and won an award of distinction from the American Institute of Architects. In fact, it gained so much notoriety that a local MLA noticed it as well. And she pointed to this school as an abject failure. The reason being was that if you could build a school like this, if you could build a school like this on our budget, provincial budgets, clearly the budgets were too high. She pointed to this, to the Pacows, Strawberry Vale, and to another school here in the Lower Mainland as being proof that the budget was too high. She, of course, she didn't talk about the myriad of other schools that didn't look so good, but nonetheless, after that, provincial budget was frozen and budget was slashed. We were all laid off. And to my mind was that, you know, I was making a lot of sacrifices to be an architect. I was working long hours and I was making really no money. But if, if the very response to what you do is this, I don't want any part of this profession. So I walked. And it was at the same time, shortly after, that a buddy of mine approached me and said, hey, do you want to do something super cool that no one has ever done before? Do you want to actually ski across the infamous Iditarod Trail across Alaska, 1,860 kilometers across Alaska, no one's ever done it. I jumped at the idea. I said, if I am ever going to ski to the South Pole, it was a life-changing experience for me, skiing the Iditarod Trail. To be honest with you, I really, no one thought we were going to complete it, and I, frankly, I didn't think I was going to be able to complete it either, but everything changed out there. It's one of these classic examples of one of these journeys. Everything falls into place, and you realize what's really important in life and what doesn't matter. You start to recognize friends and family as the essence, your purpose, your legacy, the deeply important things. I came back, and a short time after, one of the partners from the practice, Fred Dallana, who I was really close with, the practice I had been working with before, Dalana Griffin, passed away. He was a young man, very unexpected. And we were having a celebration of life, and the celebration of life was being held at the St. Augustine's Parish Center, Parish Hall, on Maple and West 7th Street. And, and I knew this building well. I designed it. You see, I was with Dalana Griffin at the time, and I designed it. It was my little project. I, they let me do it completely, rectory and parish hall, and it was up to me, and I did it. And it was under construction when I was laid off. So I never actually got to set my foot in this building before until this really important, powerful day. I remember going up the steps, going in, and sitting down and hearing the tributes to Fred and reflecting on the space I was in that I had designed. And there was a colonnade that extended out from the narthex of, of the church, and I consciously kept that open because I wanted the light to come in from, from 7th Ave. And then on the other side, I designed a garden and that mirrored that, and the light was coming in as well. The idea was to create this very bright space in a very traditional building. This was a heritage class A building that had to meet those requirements. I created this barrel vaulted ceiling in the space, trying to create importance for that room, knowing full well it would be in an environment like this that it was going to be done. It was working, as I had thought. And the garden in back was this little oasis in, in a very busy area of Kitsilano that you could escape to, meditate in. 
and talk with colleagues about someone you lost. It worked as well. I remember leaving that day going, wow, I'm so proud. Like, what an amazing thing. And yeah, you may have to work like crazy, and you may not get paid, and hell, who cares about an overzealous MLA more concerned about a bottom line? There's something more important, frankly, about architecture, is that you can give back. You can give back to the community. It's a really powerful expression, and what a unique job. So, so from that point forward, I said, I was going to go back to architecture. And again, my two careers started in tandem, in parallel, but certainly not in symmetry. Because the reality at the time, I was trying to keep them as separate as I could. I didn't want anyone to know I was this adventurer heading off into the wilds. Like, what would they think about my architecture? I mean, architecture and adventure, that is different as they get. And I joke with friends, you know, I'd, I'd consciously, the phone would ring, and I'd be trying to check who the person is unknowingly. It's like, hi, this is uh, Kevin Bellily from Bellily Architecture. How can I help you? Or is it, yo, bro, what's up? <laughs> like, who am I, right? <laughs> But as time went, I began to realize, in fact, that these two things were so much closer and similar than I ever dreamed. In fact, they were coming from the same place. They, they, they were a visceral expression of my creative self. You know, they're each an art form unto themselves. Now, I get it. Architecture as art, we understand that. We all acknowledge that. But adventure? Eh, you know? That's a hard one, and I pushed it out there, and it was kind of being pushed back a little bit with me. But if you think about it, of course, architecture, the essence of architecture is, is it's, it's a vocation, it's, it's a calling, it's a passion, it's a, an artful science, it's a social art. The reality of architecture, you know, it, it ultimately, it defines a sense of space. It, it, you know, it, it provides a place for activity, all sorts of human activity. It seamlessly allows the man-made to fit into the environment. It promotes health and well-being, and it pushes hard and it's bold against the status quo. Ultimately, in the end, it requires years of mastery. It enriches, uh, enriches us, uh, you know, aesthetically, spiritually. It reflects culture and traditions. Architecture. Architecture is art. Now, the reality is that many of us, the reality, not all architecture is art, far from it. If you think about it, I mean, you think the big box store at the local mall, that's as far from an art form as is that trashy romantic novel is to literature. For me, architecture happens in that other space. It's when it transcends the, the practical and the utilitarian, the mundane, the prosaic, that's where the magic of art lies in architecture, when it, when it goes beyond the program. Now, so too adventure. The reality is, for me, as an adventurer, the magic of adventure, the art of adventure happens in that space, when it transcends the simple act of doing. It's more than that, when it becomes a visceral expression of yourself. For me, the art, the art of adventure is discovering a journal by two crazy gold miners in 1901 who rode bicycles in 1901 for 1,850 kilometers across Alaska and the Yukon, unbelievably down the frozen Yukon River, and retracing this journey, reading their journal, journal in hand, discovering how profoundly things have changed and how profoundly things haven't changed. It's all about perspective, looking at the perspective through an adventure. Also, the art of adventure is about revelation. It's about discovering this infamous Sandakan death march in the jungles of northern Borneo. A, a episode of the war, World War II, that 2,750 troops were marched, only six would survive. And we'd have an opportunity to retrace this journey. The art of this journey is actually having young soldiers come with us, nine soldiers from Australia, who are making a tribute to the fallen soldiers on that trail. And there were so many fallen soldiers and the reconnaissance so, so clear and specific and detailed that we were able to take one fallen soldier from each of their hometowns. As we walked on that trail, we'd get to a point where that soldier had fallen, we'd know where it was, and that soldier would have an opportunity to read the biography of that fallen soldier. Remembered again, revealed again after 61 years, a story forgotten. 
The art of this journey is having young bombardier, Kenny Tunney, tough guy, wraparound shades, coming up to me, tears running down his face going, this is the most important thing I've ever done in my life. The art of the adventure for me was revelation. The art of adventure is inspiration. It's about heading to back to the South Pole, heading to the South Pole. After 35 years as a dream as a nine-year-old to ski to the South Pole, to ski there faster than anyone in history and break a world record, to have 10,000 kids following me virtually, being inspired, being inspired to do whatever they want to do. And the art of adventure is standing up for something that is deeply important to you. I want to thank Tico from his last presentation. He put it out there to all of us at the end of his incredible presentation last time, saying, your next work of art, make it good for the world. I remember thinking to myself, Tico, I have a work of art that I made good for the world, and it was my journey across the Northwest Passage. You see, climate change is an existential crisis for mankind, yet we're still not recognizing it. When I skied to the South Pole, I had 1.5 billion media impressions, meaning one in five people on this planet got wind of the fact that I skied to the South Pole and broke the world record. And at the time, I realized, wow, what happens if I take an equally compelling expedition and attach a really important message to it? This was the inspiration of rowing the Northwest Passage, trying to row a 25-foot rowboat across the infamous Northwest Passage. We're talking a passage that crushed Franklin's 350-ton warships. We're talking a passage that just a generation ago, you could barely cross it in a steel-hulled icebreaker. Here we are attempting to row a 25-foot rowboat to make a statement about the profound changes happening to our world. My art form here, friends, was, was, to, it was bold. It had not been done before. This was unique. It was pushing against status quo. It required years and years, 20 years of skill development to create this mastering a te technique to do it. Some people would be incredibly inspired. A lot of others were repulsed and angry by it. Ultimately, in the end, it was a sense of performance art, really. And if, our, our music icon here in, in Canada, Stan Rogers, in his Northwest Passage saying, tracing one warm line across a land so wild and savage. That was my art form. So the two things that were so different all along were in fact in symmetry. This, this concept of being the architect, this concept of being the adventure, each was a visceral expression of myself. Each was a vocation, each was a passion, each was a calling. Now, art is the cultivation of the imagination beyond the prosaic, beyond the practical, beyond the utilitarian. It's the act of expressing ourselves, expressing our ideas, our emotions, our observations. Be it through adventure or be it through architecture, I practice my art. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Peter. Uh, Kevin, good to see you. Um, you said the Northwest, Northwest Passage trip was to amplify the message about climate change. What happened with that amplification? Well, I, I mean, I shared it, and uh, that was the key for me. And there was so much vitriol and hatred coming out of it uh, when we were out there having struggles that people started to, all the deniers uh, were overwhelming us in terms of social media. And it was really, really overwhelming to me. Uh, but then I spoke with the elders in the high Arctic, and they told me about the changes happening up there, how profound they were. So it, that's where I got committed to writing that book. And that's where we got committed to making a documentary about it. And that's where I speak about it and try to share it as much as I can. Because really trying to share the message from the people up there who are speaking a profound change. And you hear all this nasty vitriol and frankly fake news about it. But the reality is the people up there, they have no agenda. They're just speaking the way it is and how much it's changing. So I think it's making a difference. I'm trying to as much as I can as one person. But uh, that is my statement and that's where I'm sort of expressing myself. So thanks for that.
Fantastic. Thank you. Who's next? Coming up to the front. Here I come. Here I come. So state your name for us. Thank you. I'm Patty Beer, and uh, I take care of uh, an exhibit past security at International Airport for the Vancouver Aquarium. And for me, your message and the message of a lot of people around the globe is needs to be positive and needs to be en engaging and. We need, but we need creative minds to do what we need to do to move forward. And uh, that's why I'm here today. This is my first creative morning. Uh, I don't see myself as a leader so much as a synergy person, someone who wants to gather cool creative minds and look for cool alternatives. And that whole denier thing is probably our biggest struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really think what you've done is wonderful. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to look at uh, Christina Mittermeier and Paul Nicklin's work. If you haven't encountered them. They're doing some amazing stuff, again, with social media yep. and art, yep. and uh, be inspired by what you're doing and what they're doing, and let's try and do work together for all this. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, I loved your talk. Thank you. I'm Lita. So I have never owned a car. Um, I've lived and worked all around the world trying to live a carbon neutral life, but I was wondering, since you have a captive audience, is there anything else that you'd recommend that we do in our daily lives that can really make an impact? Well, frankly, it's, uh, it's political. And I think that's where we have to scream and rant and rave. It's, it's a political decision. We can do as much as we want, but on, if we're still building pipelines, eh, you know? Like, that's really what it comes down to, is that we can talk all we want. But the reality is that now we're looking at potentially four degrees warming by end of century. That's what the scientists are saying. The last time the world saw four degrees Celsius, there was no ice at the South Pole, there was no ice at the North Pole, there was no ice on Greenland, and the seas were 250 feet higher than they are today. So take notice, the next few decades are going to be kind of scary if we don't start making changes. So it's a political thing. And what I really liked in your, in your presentation, Kevin, is that you said you had this realization that you had the eyeballs and the attention of 1.5, was it billion people? Billion. People. And so then you asked yourself, how can I use this attention mm -hmm. to do something creative that can also share a message? Yes. And so I think that's, that's possible for all of us as well. Of course. Hi, my name is Mark. Hey, Mark. <laughs> In my <clears throat> symmetry-seeking art creative side of my life, a bad moment might be a shitty drawing, a meal I screwed up. Uh, I mean, the consequences are pretty low in my life. In your life, you could die. So I actually want to ask you that question. Could you share with us if it's available to you emotionally? Did you have some, any some really close calls? And what did you learn from th that moment? Yeah, I had one very close call uh, on the Northwest Passage where uh, we had lost an anchor on another close call where this huge piece of ice nearly sucked us under it. We had to cut our anchor. And we were coming around uh, Cape Perry on the Amundsen Gulf in this, locked in this, this uh, fog. And suddenly, out of nowhere, uh, we were staying close to the cliffs uh, because we, you know, staying close to shore because we had no anchor. And then this storm hit us and we were being driven out to sea. Uh, by this storm, huge uh, waves, and we couldn't resist it. And the problem was the pack ice was just offshore, so if we got caught in the pack ice in our small boat, we'd be crushed, we'd die. And uh, there was this little islet between us and the pack ice and that we had to navigate to by GPS. And somehow, in that bubble of white, in that bowl of milk, we made it. And uh, I tell you, we had 30 minutes, 40 minutes of thinking as we were trying to make our way to this tiny little islet that we couldn't see. If somehow we could get on it, we'd survive. Otherwise, we might not. And as a dad, uh, yeah, that was pretty, pretty uh, eye-opening for me, and uh, it was a very scary moment. And you realize the risks you're willing to take to make a message, because this expedition was all about making a statement. It wasn't about anything else. For me, this is what it was all about. So I had a lot of time to reflect on that. So very scary moments on that expedition on a number of occasions that um, it's quite important, I think, to know. Thanks. I'm like sitting there gobsmacked as I'm listening to this. I have uh, one question at the very back here. I gotta get my steps in. I'm wearing my Fitbit today, so. <laughs> Will you please stand and show your name? Yeah. Hi, Kevin. Hi it's there. Alice. Hi. I used to be Kevin's book publicist. Um, <laughs> but I have a question not related to the book. I'm actually curious about um, that experience you talked about at the beginning of the talk 
of having to sort of force some balance into your insane architecture life. Right. I think it's a thing a lot of us are struggling with right now. And I'm wondering if you can speak a bit about how you actually did that, like cut out stuff and manage to still make your life work or make your life work yeah. better. Well, with the expedition, really, uh, expeditions made me reflect on that and recognizing things that aren't and putting that aside. And it's an interesting one in terms of taking care of yourself, exercise. It's one of these fundamental ones that I've been doing since day one. And it's the thing I tell a lot of friends is that when things get crazy, when I absolutely don't have time to do any exercise, that's when I always exercise. Because that's when you have to. And it's that moment you step away and you go, oh, it's not so bad. And you get a clear vision. And I mean, it happened to me as a 19-year-old in school. And uh, I mean, Rena can talk to that event. It changed us. It scarred us. It was really profound. And uh, I, I've, I've changed my life because of that. I've always recognized it because you can't, you have to balance it. So it's balance, recognizing what there's a value and what there isn't, and putting priority on that. Awesome. Thank you Thanks. so much. I think I might have not enough time for one final question, but I'm going to take one anyways. Awesome. Please. Thanks, Bob. Um, Stand up. Well, congrats uh, to the nine-year-old boy who had the adventure in Montreal. <laughs> and also, is there a film in the works for the... Northwest. Oh, it, uh, no, there is a film made of the Northwest Passage, and it's called... Your trip. Uh, yes, there is a my trip, and it's called The Hand of Franklin. Uh, and interestingly, it was in, in Stan Rogers' song, The Hand of Franklin, you know, reaching for the Beaufort Sea, we saw this ice flow go by that had a hand extending, right after a near-death experience, this hand extending out of it. It was, you couldn't have carved something more perfect, and it's in my book. And we saw it and went, there goes the hand of Franklin, but that hand was trying to pull us into the passage. But it's, uh, yeah, there is a, there is a CBC documentary. Uh, my uh, cohort, Frank Wolf, on that expedition has created that, and you can see it on CBC. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. you so much, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'll have to process everything afterwards, because I want to...